unto the republic for which it comes, one nation, under God, indivisible, with the liberty of justice for all. I think that was me. I'm sorry. No, no, no. No, no, no. They're calling you. Oh, I'm, were you guys calling <laughs> I thought it was me. So the everybody understands that the uh, Federal Highway Administration planner has requested that she be uh, able to hear the meeting okay. because of traveling budget. I'm sorry. When I moved the microphone down, I thought I hit the okay. button. So it wasn't me. <laughs> you're you're doing that. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Will you stop turning it on? <laughs> well, I, I thought it was me. I thought I did that. <laughs> that way you can't ask her about this new executive order that requires a 40 percent reduction. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, Michael. My name with the El Paso MPO. Um, to join the conference as the host. Cool. Star. Please enter your host password followed by the There are two participants on the call, including you. You are joining your conference as the host. For a menu of available commands, press star pound. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to be uh, covering um the reporting of tpac several uh board uh, meetings ago the policy board adopted a policy to review and disseminate how the tpac would operate one of those operational components is to report back to the policy board attendance of the tpac members so there on the screens is, is that we have already exceeded three absences from a specific agency I talked to the agency and informed them of the possibility of losing their vote prior to them losing their vote and then there's other two member agencies that are there before you the city of Socorro and the town of Anthony that are at two absences right now so if the member agencies are not represented at the next TPAC uh, meeting they will lose their ability to vote for the calendar year if anybody has any questions or comments about that any, any reply from them? What was their reply? My reply. Also. Oh, <laughs> 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 when you're in a small town and it's all volunteers on your council and everybody works and the mayor even has a full time business, uh, you just can't get to all the meetings. So uh, whatever comes from PPAC comes has to go through here anyway. So I figured that. My attendance here is more important than feedback. Because I would just I would just be voting on something that I sent over here anyway. Mike, Moving on to open comment period. Well, I'm sorry. I have one more item. Okay. <laughs> Actually, two more items. The the other one is that uh, some time back I communicated with the policy board. We had applied for a grant. And we were fortunate enough to receive the funding for the grant. And so up there, we, we were kind of illustrating some of the deliverables we're doing with this uh, integrated corridor management uh, plan. So the idea is that we'll be looking at all the projects that we have that include transit. Ugo, can you go to the, uh, to the map? So essentially, the study area is defined on I-10, but the grayish boundary that incorporates the the two ports of entry and all the way up to Montana is that we're going to identify strategies we're going to do some modeling with those strategies and in the end we're going to make a demonstration on how those things all work together and as part of the grant application we will implement a plan to do that uh, so let me just scroll up a little bit more so the El Paso ICM team was comprised of the MPO, uh, TxDOT, the City of El Paso Sun Metro, uh, TTI, and also UTEP. Um, I'm waiting for, for some feedback from the Federal Highway Administration uh, so that I can come back and give you all the schedule and that way we can have the deliverable before the policy board. Anybody have any questions, comments on that? 
Okay. The the last item is that, uh, as you all know, we're moving uh, downtown. And so there is the map that uh, will locate the, the MPO. will be next to City Hall Buildings 1 and right behind City Hall 2. And the, what I wanted to highlight here is the parking uh, for the policy board when we have the meetings for the TPB. So I think it should be uh, demonstrated that for the executive committee and also the TPAC committee uh, members is that uh, there's no free parking when we have the meetings. So, so bring some quarters. <laughs> okay. And then our schedule here, we'll cover it uh, next month, but certainly we, we believe we're gonna be operational the week of April 27. So the last TPB meeting along with uh, the EC and, and TPAC will occur in April. So we're still here? Here, yeah. <clears throat> Wasn't there a discussion about using City Hall parking since? Yes, sir. City Hall is closed on Friday, right? Right. Why can't we park in the... No, the parking lot for City Hall is open on Friday. Yes, sir. For, for the policy Friday, board. The policy board. But then they have their meeting on Wednesday? Yeah. We, so we that won't be open then. That's right. The executive committee about. also operates okay. on Friday. And we can, uh, and Ms. Nyland said, I remember in the meeting that uh, for special occasions we can adjust those meters up. Yeah, we can. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 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 Put a bag. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, those, that's for Friday, you still be yeah, open. For, for the policy board, that's understood. Yeah. Uh, but we have other meetings. I yeah, they're the talking about the other meetings. Is on Fridays as well. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, but the TPAC is on Wednesdays. Right. Move it to Friday. That's up to you all. <laughs> Can I park in my old spot? It says District 5. <laughs> <laughs> There's a District 5 spot there. You <laughs> I think I still have the tag somewhere. I need to get it out. <laughs> well, if anybody has any other questions or comments. Okay. No? Okay. Thanks, Mike. All right, moving on to uh, public comment. We have um, four, four speakers assigned up. Uh, as, I, as I, I would ask this time that uh, we please respect the time constraints. Um, we have traditionally recognized uh, three minutes uh, in fairness to all the other speakers. Um, and just for legal purposes, we do have to uh, be fair to every, every speaker that comes before um, the TPB. So the first speaker up is Mr. Mike Rooney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mike Rooney, I want to pay a big compliment and thank uh, uh, the El Paso's new city manager. Last month, I brought up two problems. One was the loose dogs on Breckenridge and the crap dog crap problem in front of Pebble Hills <laughs> Elementary School. And bef I went and back and sat down, and before I knew it, the city manager was back there getting information from me about the problem and then he sent his deputy Mr. Finstermacher back and got more detail. I got an email from Representative Pickett saying he saw animal control out there that Friday afternoon then on Saturday I saw Representative Pickett's son who was working on a project on Breckenridge I saw him the following week he said he had seen animal control a total of five times. And what was really refreshing about the whole experience was the city manager didn't call a press conference and announce a $100,000 study. He just went ahead and got it done because he knew he could. And then also that problem of the dog crap in the neutral ground and, uh, in front of Pebble Hills Elementary, that was cleaned up. Apparently uh, the city sent his <laughs> letter a, uh, a letter. And the sad thing about it is there's two crosswalks in the area. One of them's right in that area uh, where the you know kids come, their parents, and then the people that are uh, watching the, the crosswalk. And the city, uh, you know, it should be noted, the city's done a lot to make Edgemere a nice place. They put in a, a nice bus stop there and the other block right uh, next to uh, the following uh, street over, another uh, nice covered uh, 
bus stop they've given those real nice uh, warning yellow lights that go across the road and then we've got the bike lanes and here I've got a school district that wants me to vote almost a half a billion dollars raise all my neighbors taxes 14 cents per hundred and they can't even take care of the job without the city uh, intervening so mr. Uh, uh, city manager, thank you for your proactive <laughs> way of getting business done. Thank you, Mr. Rooney. Next up, we have Mr. Scott White. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, board members. Um, <coughs> Scott White, Vela Paso Bicycle Pedestrian Coalition. Last month, uh, this board voted to delete item 6F, which was to revise the scope of work for the City of El Paso Bicycle Plan fiscal year 2015-2016 and convert the project to bicycle education and outreach. I think this morning was a very good reason why we need to bring that education money right back to this program. When we talk about air attainment and quality issues, part of what this plan was supposed to do was to get more people out there walking, biking, and that also makes our streets safer for everyone. Just last week, we lost a compatriot of two wheels the police officer who went down and if it's in a, not inappropriate not inappropriate could I ask for a moment of silence for uh, officer Ariano would you all please bow your heads thank you uh, our prayers condolences go to his family, to his colleagues, to everyone that was involved that had to deal with that. Anytime there was a loss of life on our streets, that's one loss of life too many. When we talk about making our streets safer, pedestrians and cyclists, there is a crossover effect. It makes the streets safer for every road user, not just people walking and biking, but transit users, people driving. All these things have a cumulative effect. And that's what we hope to see if that money could be brought back, not just to talk about where bike lanes are, but talk about how we all need to interact safely with each other on these roads. As there is more congestion, that means more cars interacting, it means there's more people. When we talk about the project at Zaragoza and Montwood, adding those lanes, there's too much congestion there already. and there's not a lot of good solutions when you have a lot of cars going through there. There's too much risk for collisions and accidents. We simply want to say, please, let us help everyone make our streets safer. We don't want to see any more loss of life. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Ben Powers. From Anthony uh, to City Council. Oh, from Cornetto, sorry. Oh. Good morning, Chair and Board members. My name is uh, Benjamin Romero, and I'm a town councilman uh, in the town of Anthony, Texas. And Mayor Castaneda and Mayor Vela um, are very familiar with me, and I just wanted to come and uh, just raise some concerns about one of the TxDOT roadways that we have that is uh, becoming a bit of a problem. Um, we have a road uh, called Franklin Street that runs through the center of town. Um, between both communities, a population of 5,000 in Anthony, Texas, and about 9,060 or 70 in Anthony, New Mexico, we got about 15,960 residents that are utilizing this road on an everyday basis. And every month now, the police chief is preparing a report for me. We're seeing in this specific little stretch of roadway about set six to seven accidents every month. And the most recent one ended up sending a car almost into a, a business building. And luckily that the structure was strong enough, the, the car didn't go through. But we're wanting to raise concerns because, God forbid, um, we don't get this issue and this roadway fixed. Um, we would hate to see a traffic fatality. Um, we're putting in reports, and we would just like to see if, if we get things done, if the board here can help, um, help us uh, move 
a project or get this road uh, taken care of. Um, it's a two lane roadway. Speeds are inconsistent. It's 30 miles coming up, 35 going down. And we have about six businesses right there that have no turning lanes. And some of the curves going into the businesses are raised. So what happens is when a car's coming in to turn in, they automatically stop to go over that little hill into the business and they end up basically stopping in the middle of oncoming traffic. Um, and we would just like to raise concerns and see if uh, maybe we can get in contact with people that would help us address this issue um, and see if we can do something about it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Mr. Fred Lopez. Reading about City of El Paso. <laughs> oh, okay. No problem. Glad you're here, though. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> Moving on to the next item is the uh, approval approval of the minutes for February twentieth, twenty fifteen. Move to approve. There's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <clears throat> Moving on to item number six. Uh, TBB chairperson to appoint to the executive committee a new member to fill the vacancy left by Mr. Ernie Carrizal. Um, I, I am appointing uh, Judge Escobar uh, to this position uh, for one month, and then we, we are going to have our new county administrator, Mr. Uh, Steve Norwood, uh, who, who will likely be our permanent uh, appointee uh, to, to the uh, uh, TBB. Is a vote needed on this item, or that's just no. okay? Yes, just I wish I would have seconded it anyway. So I thought I thought I'd just. Gonna Give her a month, see how she does. <laughs> All right, I'll try it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mr. Chair, we do need a motion for the appointment. <clears throat> yeah, that, uh, well, that will be coming. Um, we need to send you. Uh, well, for the appointment for the, the county Thank administrator, you. it's not before you right now. It's for to have the, the county judge sit on the executive committee. For that, we do need a motion. Oh, you need a motion for the judge? So I'll move. Okay. Second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Just with the report back on how she did. On my attendance for that one month? Yeah. <laughs> uh, next project readiness report. Thank you, Ashton. Good morning, Good morning. Board members. Roger Williams with the El Paso MTO. I'll be presenting this uh, this morning. Uh, you have a supplemental to your packet here. It's the project readiness report. Um, if um, we go back a little bit uh, in time, we used to have a project status report that we'd bring before the board. This is a much improved version of that project status report. Um, why I say that is because of the amount of coordination and effort that has gone into this report. There's been uh, months, literally months, of uh, partnering meetings, um, coordination meetings, and uh, coordination between the MPO staff and the uh, agencies that have uh, projects. The projects that we're talking about are projects in the first two years of our transportation improvement program. Okay, so what you have before you are all of those projects in this report for the first two years. Uh, the way the report is laid out is in the front you have a um, development process that was provided to us. Thank you, TxDOT. It's a very similar process that's also uh, done in New Mexico. After that, you'll see um, New Mexico projects, and there's a, a couple of pages there of that, and it's followed by transit projects, and uh, then in, in the back, it's the highway projects on the Texas side where the majority of the projects are at that uh, are in our, in our tip. Um, the intent of this report is to provide to the TPB a tool, a tool that'll assist you and seeing where the projects are at in their development. So it'll help you in making decisions on, on where those projects are. And the way it's scheduled is we're gonna be bringing this report before you quarterly. Uh, it'll go through the process of coordination with the implementing agencies. It'll come to the TPAC for a recommendation and it'll come back to the TPB. So the TPB can see it prior to a uh, quarterly STIP revision cycle. So that if there's any action that needs to be taken, on any projects at that time, we'll be able to prepare it for the next quarterly revision. So the, um, the uh, 
layout uh, we'll get into in a little bit, but first I'd like to talk about the very first page and the developmental process of your projects. This is key to what you're going to see here in a few moments in the report in that the project's development and it'll tell us its ability for a project to obligate in the target program year. And that's key. And we need to be able to see that a project is moving along as it's supposed to move in its developmental process because the uh, federal funds or the funds in not all cases are federal but of regionally <coughs> significant projects are key to making sure that the performance of our TIP is is where it needs to be. So you'll see there the planning and programming, it, it leads into the, the development of some key milestones. And that can be going on for, uh, for some time, but when we get into the project's uh, PE, the design of that project, and in particular the environmental documentation, you'll see here that on the, on the timeline down at the bottom of the report, that leading into uh, the March time frame where we're at right now in the development of a project that that environmental document is is really at the point where it should be well on its way if not complete so that's a trigger it'll tell us very soon if that project is potentially going to make its target program date so that uh, is is where you'll see in MPO and sponsor comments later on in the report where some of the the uh, flags have been raised about a project. So as, as we move along throughout the year uh, and getting to the, um, the, the end of the, the timeline there being August, this is the states, uh, state of Texas at least, fiscal year where the majority of these uh, projects are programmed. And a lot of things need to be in line so that we can make sure that a project is able to obligate. That's really the key word we need to look at here so that we're obligating, uh, in, in the majority of cases, uh, federal funds by the target date, the end of the, uh, the state's fiscal year of August. So as we're moving along, we can see the development of that project again uh, after the environmental document, the ps &E development, and moving towards getting a funding agreement. You'll see a little uh, blue block there underneath that uh, top portion where it's talking about the advanced funding agreement. It takes it could take several months to get your funding agreement uh, in place and you need to have that funding agreement fully executed meaning it is completely done it is signed and it is ready to go so that you can get a, a federal letter of authority of its federal funds so that that project can then be able to obligate and that's important uh, to the region because uh, everybody's um, being all the the MPOs and uh, districts in the state are are obligated and we have so many, or we're actually uh, allocated so many uh, funds per uh, fiscal year. And uh, at the state level, the state has uh, the, um, the, they need to be able to show that they're, they're obligating the amount of projects that we have and that we, uh, the amount of money that we have and that those projects that have been programmed by all of the entities here are uh, are being looked at throughout that year and at the end of the year there's a report and if that report shows that projects did not meet their obligation then that's sort of a black eye on the region and we need to be able to make sure that we curb that problem and we don't have that problem at the state level those funds actually can be removed from the region and taken to another region if we don't perform well in our tip so that's very important that we're able to make that happen so if you'll go over to and start looking at the, the report itself, you'll notice, and I think this is, is really laid out, and, and, and I, hope, I hope you agree, but some of you who saw the, the previous, what was called project status report, it was, it was pretty cumbersome, it was kind of hard to read. But you'll see there's some uh, key elements that are outlined up on the top uh, of the report, and these are the milestones, if you will, as we're going through the report. You'll see, like I said, there's the New Mexico side, the transit side, and then you can flip on over to the highway side. I'm actually over to uh, page nine right now. You can see uh, where we start getting some alerts. But up along the top of that report, you can see the milestones, the LAPAFA there. That's what we're uh, referring to as the agreement, the public involvement, the public involvement that the uh, agencies are, are doing for the individual projects themselves, the review by the district, 
the uh, schematic, the environmental, the PSME, the right of way, the utilities. The FPAA is actually what is the uh, ability to uh, authorize and obligate a, a project. Uh, and then we also have the construction element there that's showing uh, uh, the uh, estimated uh, completion date of construction. And uh, that's, that's also uh, very important that we're, that we're tracking uh, all of those elements throughout the, the development here so that when we get this project back or this uh, report back to the uh, TPAC, they can start assessing as to where that project is in its development. So you can see that uh, we have some, and there's an alert column here where we have uh, some uh, uh, red, orange, and yellow colors. The red is the most severe. That's, that's telling us that at this point in time, this project's really in trouble. It's not likely to make its target obligation date. The orange is a less severe, but it has some complicated issues potentially that <coughs> could slow things down. And it could affect the ability of that project to uh, be able to uh, obligate and, and on time. And then the yellow is the uh, less severe, but we, and, and you'll see most of those are actually out in the next uh, fiscal year 2016. But we're looking at 2016 projects right now. When we get together with our coordination meetings, we, we, we're starting to look at projects further out in the next couple of years because you really need to be able to track a project throughout its uh, progress, not only uh, at this point in time, but well before that to make sure that that project's moving along. And if there's any issues that are uh, happening through our coordination meetings and our district, uh, district design review meetings, uh, those, those items are brought up. And we, uh, we have even more intense meetings where we get uh, a little deeper into the project and we start talking about how to solve some of these problems. So this is what, uh, what uh, we we're hoping will be able to be a good tool for the uh, Transportation Policy Board to assist you in looking at the, um, the projects that are in our TIP and to help you make decisions on, on uh, whether or not these projects need to have some sort of action to uh, get those projects uh, potentially um, out of uh, you know, the way so that uh, other projects that can use those monies can actually, in this amount of time that we have, can, can, can take those funds and get them through the process because the problem is once you start getting to the May time frame and the, and the state's year, uh, we have um, very little time to react so that we can get uh, projects that may need to be uh, reprogrammed with funds appropriately uh, programmed so that the, uh, the STIP process can take its, uh, go through its progress or its process because it may take up to a couple of months to do that. Once you've got a project in the right place, then you, and, and assuming that all the things are in order and it's all lined up like it needs to be, then the implementing agencies need to get together with the state and develop the final fully executed funding agreement in order to get those funds obligated within this, uh, within this fiscal year. So that at the end of the fiscal year, the performance that we're showing to the state is a good one that we can show that we've actually done good things with our with our monies. So uh, I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions. I haven't gone into detail about specific projects. That can be done if we need to, but this is just an overview of how the report works and, and hopefully how it will really assist the PPD. Um, Roger, this is a great tool. Um, so many, many thanks to everyone who was involved in doing this. This is incredibly helpful, and it, it shows us in black, white, red, and yellow, more importantly, um, what we have to do as the policy board members um, to make sure that, as you say, we present a tip that, um, you know, will not put us at risk of losing money. Thank you. That's right. It's so a thank you. Effort. Thank you very it's much. It's a lot of work and a lot of people are involved in, in making this happen. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you for all your work on this. Okay. Um, we, we have this as a discussion and action item. One of the things here uh, that, that we just want to demonstrate 
is that the next step of the statewide uh, plan, we are going to bring um, any potential changes to the step if we're going to do that. The, the window of opportunity is in April with this policy board. We would make those submissions in May. So in, in the event, as Roger has pointed out here, there are projects that are of concern to the region. Those that are in red demonstrate probably an inability to obligate this fiscal year. So, you know, again, one of the, the things that the policy board needs to consider is that should we deprogram those projects that are in fiscal year 2015 in order to have that money available for other projects? So, Mike, wh when do we have to take action on, you know, dealing with the red and the yellow projects? At what point should we, you know, as a policy board, say, um, you know, city, is there anything else that we can do to assist? Or, you know, can we bump those to the following year so that we, you know, don't present a tip that is unsuccessful? I guess the engagement judge is now. And so one of the recommendations I would have for the policy board is to direct TPAC to come back next month and identify those projects that are of concern, specifically the rent ones, um, and see what we can do with those, whether we're going to fully deprogram them or identify their challenges and possibly reprogram. But, but can we take action on this item to do so, to direct the TPAC to do that? Yes, ma'am. I'd make that motion. Second. There's a motion and a second uh, to direct TPAC to uh, recommend projects that need to be deprogrammed uh, and report back uh, next TPB meeting. Yes, sir. Okay. There's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Item number eight, uh, draft policy, draft project call, project reporting policy. As Mr. Williams uh, illustrated is that there's been a lot of coordination between the MPO, the state DOTs, and the sponsoring agencies so that we can have a very good uh, understanding of the challenges or the opportunities that we have with our projects in our planning documents, specifically in the transportation improvement program. One of the things that I'm demonstrating here is that over the last uh, five years or so, we have uh, an assessment of our TIP. So if you all look at the middle column is that the policy board has approved through the TIPS uh, ver various uh, projects. So we call this programming. So for example, in 2011, fiscal year 2011, we programmed 28 projects and we're able to obligate it within the prescribed fiscal year. And as we go down the path, I think it's very uh, illustrative that we have not been successful in obligating our projects within the TIP. Part of the <coughs> new requirements under MAP 21 is that we assign performance measurements and how the MPO is functioning from a multiple uh, viewpoint and areas. The TIP is certainly one of them. In the TIP, we demonstrate our priority projects. And so one of the things that we felt was very important is to assess where the projects are, and therefore you have that project readiness report now. So if somebody were asking us what our batting average is for the last five years, it's just not really good. It's under 50%. So the goal in 2016, we programmed 24 from the original uh, tip. And so ideally we would want to obligate all 24. But understand is that we could adopt policies or direct TPAC or the agencies to give us 100%. But I will tell you that project programming and clearing it are two different things. There are always challenges. So I think that we certainly, for 2016, want to have a 85, 95% window of opportunity. But again, is that through TPAC and the MPO, is that we probably need to assess what we can do. So, go to the end. So what the MPO has done is that it's, go. So what the MPO has done is that it's reviewed its past practices and we uh, <coughs> demonstrated this to TPAC so that we can kind of streamline what the process is with regard to project calls, 
uh, what's eligible for project calls, when is it eligible, and then ultimately the project reporting is what Mr. Williams uh, covered. So before you, let me just start with the project call. Is that the policy board approves a long range plan, which is the MTP, the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, and its corresponding short range plan. The short range plan is important, as you see from the last uh, demonstration of those fiscal years, this is where the real money is at. This is where we're going to obligate and construct projects. So the idea here is that when you develop these two documents, these are the priorities for the region. So normally for traditional funding is that we would have the agency submit projects through that development of a new MTP and TIP. Um, and then we go through the entire process as we talked about in training for the conformity termination we would get an assessment back from the partners, the federal partners, and then ultimately we would have a joint uh, uh, conforming termination by the FHWA and the FTA. Then we have a plan that's active and we can move forward with obligating and construction our pro uh, constructing our projects. So here what we're saying is that when we're developing a new plan, we're gonna have the initial call. In the event, as we move through time, and monies become available or money just falls out of the sky is that the policy board has the authority to review projects that are in the first four years which is the tip again we can identify projects that are in there and accelerate them with new monies that are available or any balances that are available in the event that there are no projects that are eligible for that funding or are ready to go certainly we can look just outside the tip to accelerate that one of the past practices that the MPO has had, and certainly we can see from our batting average, is that when there's monies available, we see we simply look at the money and we just throw a project at it. So that really isn't a very good practice for us. One other thing here with the, the project call, again, when we talk about funding balances uh, that have to be reprioritized within the TIP and the associated uh, MTP without triggering conformity. So one of the things that was demonstrated at the training is that once we have a conforming document, the two uh, major planning documents, the MTP and the TIP, it becomes very hard to try to convince our federal partners that we need to dump in another project uh, that is a potential air quality concern. If that's the case, then we have to restart the process again. Uh, the other element to this is of course a project that is being submitted to the MPO needs to be a regional significance. The second paragraph, we talk about the project being nominated, um, and it's a function of it being reviewed, of course, by TPAC through the other tool that we have, which is a project selection process. Along with some other requirements that we're asking of the member agencies, is that the sponsoring agency needs to submit to us a schematic or a concept design for an added capacity project. And again, an added capacity project is that we're gonna introduce a new roadway or potentially new lanes to an existing facility. This avoids a lot of problems going down the road when we are modeling the project. Along with this is that there is a requirement to provide to the MPO a project a request form. We do that now, but we just wanna memorialize it in this policy. The other component, uh, component to this is that TPAC would make a recommendation of a project list to the policy board for funding considerations. And this is a practice we already do. The other component to this is that we would submit projects in accordance to the appropriate state uh, statewide uh, improvement plan. <coughs> and from there, we would be looking at opportunities to amend during the federal fiscal year, and that's in February. Actually, it starts in November, February, May, and August. So these are the updates to the statewide plan, which we currently do. Uh, the other thing is that we need to ensure that the projects that are being approved by the policy board are obligated within the state uh, fiscal year, uh, so that way they can proceed into the statewide plan. The second component to this policy is project reporting. So Mr. Williams earlier gave you a demonstration of how we dissect the performance capability of a project to obligate within the state of fiscal year. 
what I want to reiterate is that projects have to be of regional significance. Uh, the report may include, but is not limited to, a funding agreement, a schedule to include the performance end date of the project, the design, environmental, public engagement, rights of way, and construction, uh, construction status as applicable. <coughs> so again, what Mr. Williams demonstrated is that we're doing that now, and we just want to memorialize it through this policy. <coughs> The other component to this is that we would have partnering meetings, like Mr. William had demonstrated. And so the effect here is that we would meet monthly with those partnering meetings. And every quarter, we would come back to the policy board to report on the status of the project readiness. And those months are there for you. The idea is that we would raise the alarm during these partnering meetings so that the policy board can react or be proactive in its decision making. The other element to the project reporting is that uh, certain requirements that we're asking for the projects to be reported at a minimum is to encompass the federal fiscal year plus one. So like Mr. Wad Roger said, uh, Mr. Roger Williams said is that we're looking at the current fiscal year plus one. But we, through our coordination meeting, our understanding, we need to be looking out a little bit further out to ensure that projects are rolling in the appropriate uh, fashion. Here's where the fun start, where the fun uh, element comes in, is that projects that do not demonstrate an ability to obligate within the program year, they're subject to deprogramming uh, by the policy board by the second submission of the statewide transportation improvement program. So this would be in February. So the idea here is that if you have a project that needs to construct within the stated fiscal year, it really has to be cleared by the first quarter of that stated fiscal year. The likelihood of environmental, right of way, utility, and et cetera, is, is unlikely that it will be clear. But again, is that through the progress of the project readiness report and the partnering meetings will have a very good assessment of the project status. The other thing here that is in red is that we want to make sure that our projects are, are demonstrating continuous progress. So one of the opening remarks I had is that when you program projects and you start to work on those uh, projects, there's a lot of complexities. So certainly we don't want to deprogram delete or de-obligate a project, understanding that there's challenges with it. It's a regional priority. So we need to have flexibility in the policy to identify that progress is being uh, conducted uh, so that we can assess it and then put it in the appropriate year so that we can at some point in time reprogram it into the tip. Of course, the policy board is the deciding body and it can reprogram a project into another federal fiscal year within the TIP or of course the MTP providing that there's adequate funding and it does not in fact, uh, impact the financial constraint or the conformity determination of the set uh, transportation policy, uh, sorry, the set uh, planning documents. One of the things here I, I wanna point out is the last couple of sentences. When we do uh, our MTPs and because we're a non-attainment area, we have a base year when we do our modeling. So currently that's in 2007. Then we have a forecast, which is 2040. Therefore we call the plan, the 2040 Horizon Metropolitan Transportation Plan. Because we're a non-attainment area, there's certain milestones when it comes to air quality. Our first milestone or demonstration year for CO, carbon monoxide, is 2020. So the federal rule prescribes that from your base year, you can have a year of uh, demonstration times and it's 10 years. So you have a 2007 and technically we can have 10 years out, which is 2017. So what we did is that we prescribed several fiscal years, sorry, several network years as we call them, uh, 2010, 2020, 2030, and 2040. So essentially we have 10 year bands where we program these projects. So if you take a look at it, is that if you have a 2010 year, and then you have a 2020 uh, year that's hitting up, our tip lies in the middle of that. So our current tip is uh, 
14 and 15 to 18 all these things here so we have 15 to 18 so what that tells you is that we have two years to play with right before we hit that demonstration year so if we have a project <coughs> that is not going to uh, be obligated within the tip well we can react but if we don't have funding balances outside the tip uh, or it's going to trigger something else we essentially put the entire region into a lapse so the lapse component is again demonstrating to the federal partners that we can have fiscally constrained our MTP and TIP the two planning documents and still meet the national requirements for air quality so here what we're saying is that in the event a, pro a project negatively affects the financial constraints and or conformity termination the project sponsors non-capacity project will be first subject to the reprioritization and if we still can't fiscally constrain it then the idea is that we will look at the other member agencies projects because it's far easier if you will to reprogram those projects that don't affect our quality than to try to react to the conformity lapse component and of course if a project is deprogrammed it goes back into the pool of balances that the MPO has for others to uh, compete against. So if anybody has any questions. Sure. Uh, I have one question first. Um, I guess as, as part of the uh, project reporting policy, uh, the chart that that's uh, included in here, is it possible, I guess, to include, because this is the, the cumulative of, of all projects of all agencies, right? Yes, sir. Is, is it possible to, to include um, subcomponents by agency to to help um, agencies identify uh, whether or not you know they're having problems pushing pro projects through or uh, is that possible to create sort of that subcomponent by yes, agency? I, I think if I understand it correctly, just just take 2016 for example, is that we can break down the programming by agency, and towards the end of the year we would come back and report the agency's ability to obligate in that fiscal year. Or, or are you saying where it's 8% for 2015, we're all sponsoring entities 8%? Or is that the cumulative? That's the cumulative. average. Right. So but it's saying every, who is 8%? Was Textot 8%? Was right. the city of El Paso 8%? Was the county 8%? Well, we can go back and make that assessment. And certainly the policy board can direct us to <coughs> deliver it however it needs it. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think including, um, Sort of those sub sub charts by agency would be would be okay. an additional helpful tool. Additional helpful. Okay. Mayor Miller. I think the kind of the same thing I, the same thing I had was if, did you do an analysis of the figure and see where if there was a predominant factor in favor of those programmed mm. over as opposed to obligated? Well, what so we did in terms of the failure, failure analysis. Mm -hmm. We simply looked at the project readiness of a project. And so the assessment we have is that the past practice of having balances available and an agency uh, coming to the policy board through the TPAC and asking for that money for a project, there was no sense of how the project was being scoped or a schedule that was being provided to ensure that it would obligate within that certain fiscal so with a change in policy you should see these numbers change not only the number of program will, will be reduced but there should be a higher success rate is that correct correct so when we program projects within a prescribed fiscal year let's say we're looking at 2016 we're hitting 24 the goal is to obligate all 24 and last year we had 43 knowing that half of them were going to drop out or something if you take everything away from Texas, does anybody else have any questions or comments? Any other questions or comments? <laughs> so the action item on this might give you the, the TPB to uh, adopt this project reporting policy? Yes, sir. So moved. Okay, so there's a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. There's a motion and a second. Uh, to adopt the project reporting policy um, as described by Mike. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. 
Moving on to item nine, amend the Horizon 2040 uh, MTP and the Horizon 2015-2018 TIP. And I guess we'll hear all these items. I guess currently, or start. Good morning, I'm Ramirez, chair of the TPAC. If you wanted to go one by one, at our meeting on March 4th, the TPAC voted to recommend to the TPD that these amendments be approved um, for items A, B, D, and E. Those are changes in the funding from county TRZ to county vehicle registration fee. Additionally, item A is moving the uh, project from fiscal year 15 to fiscal year 16. Um, for items, C, F, and G, those are moving the projects out from, um, for C from 15 to 17, as well as a change in funding. And then on F, moving the project from FY15 to 17, that's the Delta Overpass project. And on G, I have a floor amendment to make on this item, which consists of three um, components. For the I-10 to Loop 375 border highway east to east and west to west project, the amendments include to delete the for signage only phrase, to revise the limits from spur 601 to Yandel, and to revise the funding as follows, 4,920,000 of VRF to change to category 12 funding for a total category 12 amount of 16,330,000. Um, so these are the uh, revisions that were approved at the TPAC and uh, recommend that the TPB also approve them. Okay, so the action item for here would be to uh, approve the amendments for uh, item A through G uh, as presented. With, with the floor amendment on G. Just, Thank just you. A, just have a little more explanation on the G, I'm just not following what the, it just it's just funding changes, there's no other? G is the project that affects Lake and Center, and part of the reason is that given the differences we find between the modeling and reality, uh, the controversy over the project and the extra time that it's going to take in terms of uh, uh, environmental process we're moving the project out and the reason we're changing the limits is because of signage and it's just simpler to state those project limits in terms of US 54 rather than I-10. I'm glad I asked. <laughs> okay. Because I wouldn't have picked that up. So we're changing the limits from basically from Cesar Chavez to Spur 601. So that goes, so that would be west no, to 54. Cesar Chavez to right. Yandel. Right, <clears throat> okay. 54. Okay. And Spur 601 at Fred Wilson. Is that? Roger Williams, El Paso MPO. What we're trying to do with the limits is remove the spur 601 at Fred Wilson and replace it with the Yandel. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What we're doing with the funding is there's currently uh, vehicle registration fee funds in this project at uh, the amount of 4920000 mm -hmm. Those VRF funds are being taken out and it's being incorporated into the Category 12 uh, match uh, to the VRF. So that, that amount will go up by the amount was taken out of the local amount. The total funding in this project is $24,985,000. Uh, and th there's an earmark in here that's uh, an uh, amount of about $4.6 And uh, there will be some um, STP uh, out in 19 um, for this in a, the amount uh, potentially of about $4 million and then the category 12 that I stated at the 16.3 million. Has the, the earmark, how long has that been out there? It's been out for quite some time. We, we don't have do to those anymore, so how, have, have we found out whether it's still applicable? It is still applicable. Okay. We have checked on that with federal Highway. Do we have any more? Because, I mean, like I said, they don't do earmarks anymore. So we There's another earmark and some money still left on the, um, 
the Seal Hill Northley project on the uh, west side of town that potentially can still be used and it's not in danger of being lost uh, at, at this point. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? There was a motion on the floor, but I don't believe there was a yeah. second. I second. Second? Okay. There's a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, next item to approve requests uh, to excuse absent TPV members from the meeting. Is this absent from the class this morning or absent from the whole meeting? <laughs> <laughs> I want the teacher to know I was here on time for class. <laughs> Brought <laughs> apple. Um, I have to excuse Representative Emma Costa, State Representative Mary Gonzalez, State Representative Marisa Marquez, State Representative Joe Moody, the State Senator Jose Rodriguez, New Mexico State Senator Jose Cervantes, and New Mexico State Representative um, Mr. Gomez. Okay. That is all that I have. And members of the legislature are, are excused while um, while they're in session. So, um, so thanks you. to Chairman Pickett, to Representative Blanco, and I know so your you. schedules are hectic during this time, and I'm sure that um, well, if, the we're, if he's here and I'm here, nothing's going on there. <laughs> 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 so, uh, is there a motion to uh, excuse absent TPV members? So moved. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, the next uh, monthly report, uh, I have nothing to report. I just want to uh, thank, once again, as always, thank staff for, for all your work um, in producing these great uh, updates. I think they've been very helpful in um, getting policies that have been long <laughs> overdue. So thank you for all your work. Thank you very much to everybody. The next meeting is scheduled for uh, the 17th of April uh, at 9 a.m. Is there a motion to at this location, we have not moved downtown oh, yet. Yes. Oh, and that'll be our last. Yeah. And that'll be yeah. our yeah. Yes, sir. Since that's the date, I would like to announce that our good friend, this is our good friend, Mayor Reinhardt's last meeting here with us today. Oh, so, oh Mayor. Thank you. Uh, oh. Just want to recognize that he's been here 10 years and been a faithful meeting member of this group. Thank Mayor you. Mayor Reinhardt, thank yes. you for your service. And he's had a full double duty with uh, the TPAC and other meetings, so thank you for your service to Y'all hear me off of moving to Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> There's just no extradition, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? There's a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? <laughs> yes, yeah, second. Okay, all in favor? Sleep. Any opposed? Motion passes.